<clears throat> Please look in your uh, hymnals to the back, page 36, to the Heidelberg Catechism, question 75. working on a series of sermons on the church and her sacraments, kind of set up the stage for it in our understanding of the church itself. Last week we considered baptism, and now for the next few weeks we'll consider the Lord's Supper and uh, hopefully be able to conclude with a, a climactic sermon on worship itself. I'll read the bold print here, and you can follow in the fine print Page 36, Lord's Day 28, question 75. How does the Lord's Supper remind you and assure you that you share in Christ one sacrifice on the cross and in all his gifts? In this way, Christ has commanded me and all believers to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup. With this command, he gave this promise. First, as surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup given to me, so surely his body was offered and broken for me and his blood poured out for me on the cross. Second, as surely as I receive from the hand of him who serves and taste with my mouth the bread and cup of the Lord, given me as sure signs of Christ's body and blood, so surely he nourishes and refreshes my soul for eternal life with his crucified body and poured out blood. Amen. What a wonderful statement of the Lord's Supper in the Heidelberg Catechism. Now turn in your Bibles, if you would, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We have four clear institutions of the Lord's Supper, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and uh, here in 1 Corinthians 11. Now today's sermon is just, is, 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 for all that's being said, it has a very simple point. And that is the title. Uh, we need the Lord's Supper because we need the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the one who comes to us and offers himself to us in the supper. In other words, really and truly, ultimately, I don't come to feed on bread and wine. I come to feed on Christ's body and blood. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 26, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father in heaven, how we pray for the Holy Spirit to illumine us and to refresh us in the richness of this meal. And we pray, Lord, may all of us, uh, Lord, uh, be rightly informed, rightly illumined to peer in to this wonderful meal of the new covenant in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> if you ever happen to read the marquee uh, out here at the uh, Veterans Memorial District, uh, you will see sometimes flashing uh, Covenant United Reformed Church uh, Meet with Christ. Uh, you may say, oh, come on, that's, that's claiming way too much. And uh, my answer to that is that's stating exactly the single thing we're doing here. 
We meet with Christ. So parents, when you get up in the morning, and your parents, your kids are slow and they're moving and they don't want to come, don't say to them, hey, you get to come and see your friends. Don't tell them that. Say, hey, you get to come and meet with Jesus. So let's get ready, okay? How can you turn away from that? So when we come to church, we come because we need Christ. And we need the means of grace, baptism, the Word, the Lord's Supper, through which Christ comes to us. When I come to church, I need to be cleansed by Christ because I, I'm dirty. We read Isaiah 6 with Isaiah the prophet. If Isaiah, God's choice prophet, wrote 66 chapters, if he needs to be cleansed when he comes in the chapter, I guarantee you, you do. And I do. We're no Isaiah. But we need it. We need Christ's blood sprinkled upon us. And thus we see and we learn every Sunday as we come in to worship the Lord, I need the benefits of my baptism. I need the sprinkling of the blood again uh, as I come. I need to hear what baptism has secured for me, that I am forgiven. I'm cleansed. My conscience is free to come and worship the Lord. Number two, when I come, I need to hear Christ speak to me. I need to have my mind renewed, and thus I have the Word of God for the renewing of my mind. And I also need to commune with Christ. I need to be nourished in His body and blood and assured that He is mine and I am His. And that's what the Lord's Supper does, is it feeds my soul. My conscience needs cleansing. My mind needs to be renewed. My soul needs to be fed and this is what the means of grace do for me. Christ comes to you and to me through these visible means and brings an invisible, spirit-administered grace to us to bind us to Christ. And so the church, as I mentioned earlier, the church itself is sacramental. We not only have sacraments, the church is sacramental itself in that the visible assembly of the people of God are here with an invisible reality that's the real essence of who we are and why we've come together. We are the temple indwelt by the Spirit of God, Ephesians chapter 2. And so when I come to church, I come to receive Christ. I come to see Christ. I come to respond to Christ. Now many people come to church and they walk out and they say, well, I didn't get anything out of it. Ever hear that before? And then, then they get pressed with this question, well, what did you put into it? If you would have put something into it, you probably would have got something out of it. And this is all wrong. Church isn't, a, isn't the work you come to do. You ever notice when you come to church what you actually do? You show up and you sit down. And then there's other things, of course. But I mean, really, I mean, the, the church means assembly. We assemble, we show up, we come, and we sit down together. We assemble. We're church. And there's a good reason for that. And the good reason isn't so you can be entertained by an engaging, you know, uh, you know spiritual kind of late night celebrity uh, fella uh, that uh, is, uh, you know, fun is kind of a functional celebrity, half celebrity, half guru uh, that, that's going to kind of, you know, get you motivated. That, that, no, that's not it. You assemble together and you sit together because you've come to receive. You're in a receiving posture. Because when you come to church, first and foremost, something is given to you. And thus, you are here to receive what is given. And that means that church is an event of grace. 
It's a gift. Now, I guarantee you, if I called you up before church on Sunday morning and I said to you, be sure to come to church today because you got an amazing gift. And you say, well, what is it? And I'd say to you, well, you know those new Corvettes? Yeah, well, it's better than that. Hang up. <laughs> All right. Who's not going to be there? <laughs> but that's the truth. You come to receive the gift of grace. God giving to the undeserving. And that's why we have you sitting to look up here. To look at the means of grace. To look at the font. To look at the pulpit. To look at the bread and the wine. Why? Be your oriented to look up here to see and to be pointed toward Jesus Christ. To see Him through the means of grace. Because that's how Christ comes to us. He comes to us through the means of grace. That we might see Him. That we might meet with Him. That we might receive Him and His benefits. And therein that we might commune with Him. So we come as receivers. We come to church. And become as responders. Because you need Christ. And upon receiving Him, you have opportunity to respond to Him with prayer and praise. And to proclaim your allegiance to Him in the creeds. And to express thanks. Come into His presence with thanksgiving. And we call that event, this event, this grace event of church. We call it a covenant dialogue. God speaks, you respond. God initiates, you respond. It's a covenant of grace meeting between God and His people wherein we meet with Christ. Christ, the groom, you, His bride, in whom He is in covenant relationship with, with whom he is one flesh. Christ the shepherd with you, his lambs that he brings to still waters and green pastures. Christ the king, that he might raise his scepter and rule over you, his citizens. Christ the Lord, you his servants. And today, we come to the Lord's Supper. Of those three means of grace. Why do you need the Lord's Supper? You need the Lord's Supper because hungering for Jesus, you need to eat and drink of Him. That's why you need the Lord's Supper. You come distant, you come remote, out of sorts, sideways, hard week, difficult week, easy week. See, both an easy week and a difficult week both lead you to the same place. I'm away from Christ. Easy week, I was too indulgent, I'm away from Christ. Difficult week, I'm all frazzled, I'm away from Christ. So what do you do? You come to church. You come to church to draw near to the Lord's Supper and commune with Him. To eat of Him. That's fellowship. Fellowship with Christ and fellowship with each other. We fellowship together in consuming and eating, feasting upon and communing with the body and the blood of Christ held out to us in the Lord's table. So that means a relationship of the Lord's Supper itself. Now we've already learned that the sacraments are a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. They are a sign and seal of the grace of the covenant. They're an invisible, they're a visible means through which an invisible reality visits you and you enjoy. So the covenant is the nature of our relationship with God. One time I asked a person, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? How do you know you're going to heaven? He says, well, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I think, hmm. He knows he's going to heaven because he has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Does he have a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ? 
Because you have a personal relationship. It has to do with me as a person. And if it's you as a person having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that accent falls upon you being in control of the nature of that relationship. Covenant relationship means God's in control. He's designed the nature of the relationship. He's the initiator of it. It's a different twist. Not that there's anything wrong with having a personal relationship with Jesus because that covenant relationship is very personal. But the covenant relationship means God is the one who's in control. He is the authority. And thus we bow to him. He's the one who comes to impose obligations and commitments and consequences upon us. And we have here, as we read in 1 Corinthians 11, what is being administered is the new covenant in contrast to the old. And when the people assembled on Mount Sinai, they assembled together on that mount, and what happened is that God spoke to them. He delivered his word to them. And that word that he delivered to them came in the form of two tablets of stone written with ten commandments on each tablet. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, having to do with this administration of God's voice, God's word and covenant, says this, The Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to do. That is the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone, and the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them. There it is. The covenant on Mount Sinai, written on the two tablets of stone, called the Ten Commandments, were given to them by way of commitment to do. And God gave them. And they said, okay, Lord, we will do them. Now notice the order and the pattern when the Ten Commandments are given on Mount Sinai. First, the commandments are given, and the people say, okay, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. They hear his word. They respond to it. And then it says that the elders that were up there ate and drank in the presence of God and ratified that covenant relationship. But first came the word then came the eating and drinking. First the word is to be proclaimed, then we proceed to the Lord's table, because the word explains to us the meaning of the table. That's the order in Sinai, and that's the order in Zion. That's the order in the Old Covenant, that's the order in the New Covenant as well. But however, there's a difference in emphasis in worship in the Old and the New Covenants. We must observe that difference. We must know that difference. We hear the Word here in the New Covenant. We do the sacrament. We hear the Word, we do the sacrament. That's what the text says. Do this in remembrance of me. What were they to do on Sinai? The commandments. <laughs> That's what they were to do. And we are immediately informed of a distinction between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. For on the Old Covenant on Sinai, as he gave them that law, what did the people say? He gave them that law to do, and the people said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. And God said, that'd be great, because he who does these things will live by them. We get blessed. But if you don't, you'll be cursed. That was the deal in the Old Covenant. But in the new covenant in Jesus Christ, as we see here in the Lord's table, there is something distinctly different. The doing is not in commandment keeping. The doing is in eating. The doing is in drinking. A distinctive difference between the old covenant assembly and the new covenant assembly in worship. This do in remembrance of me. 
This do, eat my body. Eat this bread. The bread informs us that God has become man in Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And as man, Christ took upon himself all of our covenant obligations. Galatians 4.4 tells us that he was a, a man born of a woman, born under the law. Christ took upon those obligations. He took upon all that the, the, the Ten Commandments called for upon himself and upon his life with the promise of God that if he does them, he'll live by them. And this is where we lay hold of Christ and the righteousness that the law demands. Because if you stay back in Sinai with all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, I'm going to tell you where you're going. You're going right into the toaster. That's where you're going. Because you're not going to do it. You're going to fail. You're going to sin. But here in the new covenant in Jesus Christ, Christ, in his manhood, took upon himself all the demands of the law and kept it from cradle to cross. Perfect righteousness. And so when we come to the new covenant in Jesus Christ, he says, do this. Eat my flesh. Remembrance of me. What I have accomplished in the flesh, you share in my flesh and you receive the benefits of my flesh in your own humanity. That's right. The perfect righteousness that the law requires you to perform and you have not performed, I have performed and now give to you in communion with me. May you be joined to me. And thus we eat his body. We eat his flesh. We partake of the bread by faith that we might share in his perfect righteousness. And we might hear from God the resulting conclusion of well done, my good and faithful servant. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. The righteousness required. Heaven's gates swing open wide. Come and commune with your Father in heaven. Eat this bread. An act of union and communion with Christ in his humanity being joined to him by faith. This do in remembrance of me. Christ's righteousness becomes your righteousness. That's not all. Eat this bread. That in communing with Christ's body, that his obedience would be worked out in your life. Being your humanity being joined to his humanity means your humanity undergoes transformation in union with Christ's humanity. Change. So that you begin actually to live out in your life a new humanity in Jesus Christ as you feed upon him who is the bread of life. Two great benefits are communicated to you when you eat the bread in faith. Justification, clothed in a perfect righteousness as if you'd never sinned and have been obedient all along, and a real change and transformation in your humanity. So that your heart undergoes metamorphosis, sanctification. That's the pledge of the covenant. This is what we do. This is the do that we do in the new covenant. We open our hand. We open our mouth. And we receive Christ. That's what happens. We come knowing we've sinned. We come knowing we sinned. But we trust in His obedience for righteousness. We know that we have sinned. But we trust in Him to work in us and transform us in union with Him, to be conformed after Him, to be metamorphosized as we look upon Christ. And we hear Jesus say to us, as we eat the bread, as we drink the cup, 
You're mine. I am yours. In all the benefits that I have secured, I now give to you in communion. Secondly, we are called to drink the cup. The Old Covenant required obedience for blessing, for life. And that is realized in the body of Jesus Christ. His humanity has achieved it. But the cup, the cup satisfies the Old Covenant requirement for cursing, for disobedience. That's what the cup does. The cup tells us that the curse has been dealt with in the blood of Jesus Christ. Cursed is everyone who does not do all things written in the book of law to perform them. That word perform is do, to do them. Cursed be them. Do all those things or you will be cursed. But what does the cup say to us? Do this in remembrance of me. Drink this cup, this cup of the new covenant. Because this cup brings home to you the promise of forgiveness. The old covenant said, curse you if you do not do all these things. The new covenant in Jesus Christ says, Christ has taken this curse upon himself. Now drink this cup, which is now for Christ a cup of cursing. For you is a cup of blessing. For in it is a sign and seal of forgiveness for you, the dirty, rotten sinner that you are. And if you believe you're a dirty, rotten sinner, you ask yourself a question, where am I going to go now? Now what? I've blown it over and over and over and over. Now what? And Jesus says to you, drink this cup. Drink this cup. That's what you do in the new covenant. You come already condemned. It's a sign and seal of forgiveness. It's called a cup of blessing. Because Christ wore the crown of thorns and shed his blood. That you might drink of his shed blood. The very cup that brought him anguish and reeling is the very cup that he places in your hand. This is not a cup of cheap grace. This is not a cup of cheap wine. This is not casual. This wine, this wine sobers you. It's a costly cup. The life of the Son of God. It's costly. The precious blood of the Lamb. And I think, well, what do I have to do to get it? What, what do I have to bring? What, what exchange rate is there on a mere human terms where this costly blood can become mine? There is no exchange rate. That's why Isaiah says in prophetic language, without money, without cost, come. <laughs> come. The sacrificial blood has been poured out God's wrath has been propitiated and satisfied. The terms of the law and its call for its curse has been completely eradicated. Its curse exhausted by the blood. And that blood can cleanse you of sin and that blood can kill sin in your life. Twofold benefit. Drink the cup. Drink the cup. In volume, it's very small. It's a little tiny cup. In volume, it's very small. You compare the, the cup in the New Covenant, compared to all the blood of the animal sacrifices of the Old Covenant, there were gallons and gallons and gallons, millions of gallons of blood spilt in the Old Covenant. And not a single drop was effect, effective to cleanse or to kill sin. But this blood, oh, this blood of the precious Lamb of God 
contained in this cup and communicated to you if you receive it by faith is a sin-cleansing, sin-killing blood. Drink this cup. Gaze upon it. Put it to your lips. Taste it. Swallow it. This is the cup of the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ, which can take away our sins. It's a cup of forgiveness. It's a cup of the finished work of Christ applied to you. Drink it. Ah, it's refreshing. It brings rest. Heaven's gates swing open wide at this cup. And that's not all. There's power in the blood. Come stumbling and struggling to the Lord's Supper. The blood is, and the cup is not only a sign and seal of sin's cleansing, but of sin's killing. There is both forgiveness and mortification in this cup to partake of it. Because here at this table, here your heart is trained to awaken to the love of Christ. Here your heart is trained and taught about the love of Jesus. And, and, and Jesus, as it is, whispers through the cup, My love is the best love. Forsake all others. Forsake all, all these other loves of sin in your life. Because when we take up that cup, we take up the cross and saying no to sins and to self's pleasures. We say no to the false romances that allure and seduce our hearts. And we say yes to the love of Christ. And there it kills the love of sin. To in the bread and the wine. We have the new covenant. We have the new covenant by which we do not stand at a distance. Like in the old covenant, for a mountain thundering and the threatenings of Sinai, but we draw near. For here we take Christ into ourselves. Here we draw near as we participate in Him. Yes, we enter the Holy of Holies. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembrance. The Lord's Supper is, we are to remember, uh, we are to engage. We're not to forget the point of it all. And the Lord's Supper keeps before us. It keeps before us in response to Psalm 51 where the psalmist says, My sin is ever before me. I mean, it's stuck to me. I, this is the answer. This is the answer. This trumps the sin that is ever before me. But we must remember it. We must put biblical remembrance into action here. In, so, in Deuteronomy 5, uh, Moses said, Remember you were slaves in Egypt. As he looked at the people, he said, Remember you were slaves in Egypt. What's odd about that? None of those people were slaves in Egypt. That's what's odd about it. It's 40, gener it's 40 years later. All the, whole, the whole generation came out of Egypt. We're all gone. Except uh, Caleb and Joshua, I think. And he says to me, you remember, you're slaves in Egypt. Well, how are they supposed to do that? <laughs> because they were part of that people. And that event was an event that applied to them. That identified them. And though it happened long ago, they were to bring it to mind so that act of remembering serves to actualize that event in their lives. That accomplished event was to be applied to them now so that they were to remember that they came out. They were participants in that historic event and so too you and me. We are participants in what Christ did 
as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17, that we commune in the body. We commune in the blood of Christ when we eat the bread and drink the cup. On a non-historical level, we don't relive it. We're not Roman Catholics where all this turns into the real body and blood of Jesus and it gets re-offered again. No, it's, it's not a reenactment. It's a remembrance and an application as if it's just as tangible to us now as then. Do this in remembrance that we belong to Christ and receive the benefits of it. We have passed out of the old like the Passover lamb and we have, we're on our way to the new and we are, as it is, being metamorphosized. For we see Christ. We see Him. This is His body, His blood. We see Christ. Christ is present in the supper. And it's transforming. It's metamorphosizing in its very nature. And so, as we partake of this table together, as we receive Christ and His benefits, of justification and of sanctification as we are, as it is, laid hold of by Jesus. There are results of the Lord's Supper for us. And those results is it nourishes our souls. Our hungry, thirsty souls are nourished and satiated with meat and drink, with bread and wine with the body and blood of Christ. God wants us to respond. God wants us to respond. And this is how we respond to Him. We come to church to receive something. And they, we there and respond from it. If you come to church and Christ is being offered to you, and you, and you walk and say, oh, I didn't get anything out of it. Check for hard-heartedness. Now, if Christ is not being offered, you didn't get anything out of it. Hey, yeah, understandable. You came to church, you're told of ten ways to improve your life, or three new principles that you need to react to have a better devotional life, or four things you can do to improve your marriage, or whatever. And you go out saying, okay, i got three things to do. Hey, uh, guess what? Where have you been? You've been on Mount Sinai. You know, I don't care what they call it. You've been on Mount Sinai. You come to get Christ. And when you get Christ, if you walk away saying, I didn't get anything out of it, check for hard-heartedness. Beware. Beware. Do this. The table calls us to face what God has done in Jesus Christ, has revealed of Himself in Jesus Christ, and it calls us to face our sins and our self, but it also calls us in facing those sins and facing ourselves to lift up our eyes to something awesome, something great, something restorative. Christ and what He has done for us. Because in that moment when we recognize our great need, that moment we recognize how needy I am as a sinner in need of grace, Jesus doesn't say to you, here's some things to go do now. Here's how you can fix yourself. Jesus says to you, You're mine. You're mine. Here's my body. Here's my blood. You belong to me now. And I belong to you. And you receive him. The table calls us to remembrance, to restoration, 
to refreshment, to renewal. In this covenant, it's, it's recognizing your sins, owning up to your sin that qualifies you for the meal. In this covenant, it's recognizing your need, your hunger and your thirst for God, that you need Jesus, that God comes to you to provide for you, to feed you again and again and again and again, week after week, until He comes. Why do you need the Lord's Supper every week? Why? Because you need Christ and communion with Him every week. And if you think this is just a ritual that you knock out, in the second service, about two-thirds of the way through, you're going to get tired of it. But if you say, Jesus Christ is coming to commune with me and establish intimacy with me, where he says to me, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, when I eat of the bread, when he says to me and comes to me, you're forgiven. Hard week? Here. Take this cup. Take this bread. And you don't have to reach out for it. Someone comes and puts it right in front of you. Puts it in your hand. You see, it's grace achieved and grace delivered. So you can say, I am His. And you are. He is mine. That is the covenant that Jesus Christ has secured for you and for me. And out of that, we then walk out of worship and seek to live from that rich resource of grace, the grace of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. That's the Lord's Supper. And that's why you need the Lord's Supper. And that's why we have the Lord's Supper. For that very reason, let us pray. Heavenly